Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and on this episode 501 of the Innova Buzz podcast, I'm not the host. In fact, I'm the guest. Hosting today's show will be some of my previous guests, Dr. Catherine Lloyd and Tom Ruich, who were both our guests on our guest panel for episode 500, part three. Firstly, welcome to the show, Catherine and Tom. It's a real privilege to have you back on the show again. Well, thank you, Jürgen. Welcome to our show. (laughs) Indeed, absolutely. (laughs) And with that, I'll hand over the hosting duties to both of you. Great. Thanks, Jürgen. Hi, Tom. Good to see you again as well. So thoroughly looking forward to this. Hello, Catherine. Hello. Thoroughly looking forward to this grilling with you, Jürgen, putting you under the spotlight and, and, and getting underneath the man who has uh, put together, you know, over 500 podcasts now. So um, it's such an impressive achievement, Jürgen. And I've been listening to um, various podcasts over the, the, the recent days. And in particular, those panel conversations have been fascinating. And and the mm. the comments that have come through there in terms of what you've done in creating community and who you are as a person, you know, really shine. So um, congratulations to you and well done. So Thank we you. are going to start asking you some questions and finding a little bit more about you. And you have shared aspects of yourself, you know, over time. In your interviews, you do reveal, you know, bits here and there as we go. But now's an opportunity hmm. to dive a little bit deeper in that regard. So one of the questions I'd like to start with is really this provenance question for you about, you know, there's a story there, this AGFA story that has emerged over time. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and how that has influenced you and your philosophy and the way you think and go about things. And obviously it has influenced in terms of where Mm. you've come from in terms of innovation, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating to look back on that in hindsight and all all the other things that have played in over over the course of my career. Um, It's in some ways... I look back at it and connect all the dots and think there was a plan behind that, but of course it was very, very haphazard, very serendipitous. What It kind of goes back to my very early childhood when um, I discovered my love of photography, and I think I'm, I was about two years old because there is evidence, photographic evidence of me playing with a film box as a camera. And I cannot remember a time when I haven't been taking photographs. I had a box camera when I was five years old and I've been taking photographs ever since with a variety of different cameras. When I studied chemistry at university and when I went out into the job market, I landed a job with ACFA in their research division in Germany and I thought, wow, this is just a dream come true for me. It applies all the chemical skills, all the technical skills I've learnt during my uh, studies and it brings me into this world of photography in the back end and and it was just so fascinating to dig deeper into all the things that happen after someone takes a photograph what happens with the film what happens with the paper what happens with the slide films and all the opportunities that were there in terms of building new systems and we were working on building systems where a home photographer could very easily take their slide film and in a matter of minutes produce a print from that using an instant photographic process. That was a fascinating project that involved chemistry, physics, optics, and building equipment and all kinds of things. And I was involved in in everything. So that was really exciting. And of course, not to mention all the -the state-of-the-art photographic darkroom equipment that I had easy access to. So I thought, this is heaven. Of course, about two or three years into that role, the first digital consumer camera was released at one of the big trade fairs. And the response at ACFA, and I imagine the other big film manufacturers like Kodak and Fuji were much the same. At first, it was panic stations. Our business model is being disrupted. And then as they found out more information about this first 
digital camera, which was really not very good quality, lots of compromises. They said, that's all right, we're safe. We just need to make, keep making better film. And at that time, I thought that is such a short-sighted view because this was in the early days of the PC and we could see already the pace of change of technology and how it was accelerating because of the new developments. And it didn't, I thought it didn't really take a, a genius to predict that the same would happen in other areas, other technical areas like photography. And unfortunately, I was a very young man there are a few of us in my age group that had a similar view, but none of us had any serious influence within the decision-making layers of ACFA and so making better film, that's what we focused on there. Um, I saw the writing on the wall there and left that, but that formed my whole philosophy, I guess, around innovation in that it's not just about keep doing what you're doing and keep getting better at what you're doing. It's also about are there other ways to do this which, which would actually supplant the current business model? And if, if we ignore those, um, if we don't take those on board ourselves, somebody else is going to do it. So it might as well be us that kind of plays in this space and then figure out how to, how to transition from one business model to the next if that's what happens rather than be forced to do it or, or driven out of business, as, as is what essentially happened to the ACFA film division, to the Kodak film division, and even to the Fuji film divisions, and they were the big three film manufacturers at the time. And I thought, in hindsight, it's, it's asking the right questions. And the question for me there is, what are we doing for our customers? And the film manufacturers thought, okay, we're providing photographic film and photographic paper for photographers, whether they're professionals or hobby. But that's, that's not really what we're doing. We were providing photographers the means to capture memories. And if you look at it from that picture, it's a much higher level. Well, how else can you capture memories? So then you start talking, well, first of all, you start talking about, well, there's moving pictures as well. Um, now, of course, there were film variants that captured movies in those days, but it then opens up, well, television is kind of digital, so can you do it digitally? It opens up that whole idea of how else can you capture those visual memories? Yeah, I I love that story, Jurgen, and and what I especially love about it is it begins with the prospect and customer's story. What is it that they're going for? What is it? Mm. What what you're selling is the journey that your prospects and customers are are on. They want to capture memories, and film or digital are just means to that end, and. Can you can you tell us a little bit about how that philosophy that you brought to that particular question, Agfa, has continued to influence you and shape the innovations that you've brought to your own work? How how is the framing of that question um, influencing how how you do business today? Mm. Yeah, that's a really fascinating question. I think I ask myself that question all the time in terms of what what is it that we're bringing, and one of the things recently I'm recognising more and more, and you've you both have contributed to this realisation, I suppose, is that in having these conversations with so many guests on the podcast, it's there's this community that's grown as a result. It's kind of just happened because a lot of people have been introduced to me by previous guests. So there's a chain of that I can follow, a chain of introductions that I can follow that led me to each of you. And there's a little bit of community. And I thought, well, what if I connected all that community? So the whole question of 
I'm doing this podcast for who and for what reason is is now enabling me to think a lot bigger about what I can do with with the whole podcasting um, arena that I'm in and that's initially you would think okay I'm bringing on guests who are expert in their field my objectives really were I want to learn about that guest's expertise and then I want to share that with my audience now I say okay asking that question what am I really doing well I'm actually bringing new people into my audience's sphere of knowledge and also through those introductions I can bring guests together into each other's sphere and and enabling people to connect in that way and continue those conversations that we have on the podcast is something that I think adds a lot more value again and um, it's it's something in these day these days where you know we've had two years of kind of lockdown and travel restrictions and we haven't been able to go out physically to events and to networking um, events and exhibitions and so on where we meet a lot of people so having that opportunity to do that in a different forum I think is is really valuable so yeah that's that's one way I've kind of taken that question on board in what I'm doing today Mm. I love that story too I just it's so rich and I just was scribbling notes as I went because there's so many points in there that I think are so very very valuable that you could just you know work on you know these various things and I, I think what sort of emerged out of that for me is this, you know, that real kind of your understanding of the disruption that was happening and that you could sense mm. and see that and yet people around you <laughs> didn't probably have the same kind of insight or um, future thinking in the way that you obviously do. So you were able to kind of start to set, see that that pattern, you know, or that, um, that mm. you know, that, that, that disruption that was going to, to occur. Mm. And, well, in part and because so, I was relatively new, so I had... Yeah, in part because I was relatively new, so I wasn't burdened with a lot of um, historical perspectives that other people that had been inside this industry for so long had. Uh, at the same time, I have to say that um, there were, you know, there were things that I was doing where I thought, in hindsight, gee, I should have recognised that. And it was one of one of the conversations I remember having was in when I started there at Aqua, silver was in short supply, and one of the things they were concerned about was silver. Of course, is is the key material that that brings light sensitivity to the film. Without silver, you don't have light sensitivity. So they said, well, what else could we use instead of silver? And and we were looking for chemical solutions. <laughs> of course, digital photography is is a no silver version of taking images. And at the time, we didn't really consider that. So I, I was also encumbered or, or burdened by some barriers that were imposed or that, you know, self-imposed, obviously, because we're not looking beyond those boundaries. Mm. Absolutely fascinating. One of the... Go for yeah, it, Tom. We... I can see that you're burdening there. Catherine. No, you go. You go. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, Jurgen, when, when we spoke, I forget whether it was when I was on your podcast or you were on mine, um, we talked about the old the old story of of uh, Henry Ford and his quote yeah. that if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said they wanted a faster horse. And mm. people, uh, people question whether he really said yeah. that, but they certainly credit him with that. And, and I think that they fully um, misinterpret that. We discussed mm. this, that, that um, a lot of people will use that as an excuse to, you know, unleash your own genius, believe in what you believe. Uh, Henry Ford was a genius and he didn't burden himself yeah. with yeah. listening to his customers. And as a result, he, he unleashed the model for it. He didn't even invent the automobile, but that's the implication mm. in the, in the quote, right? Um, but the way I, the way I 
interpret that is no, Henry Ford very much had his mm. ear to the ground and understood his audience. What they wanted was faster. Yeah. And what they wanted was comfort, more comfort than a old leather saddle. And he delivered on that need. He delivered mm. um, a vehicle that was faster and more comfortable and and so it reinforces this idea that you were sharing with us that that no in the end innovation is all about listening to your audience listening to your target market so i guess i'll 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 ask you what are some of the things that you're hearing i, I don't want you to reveal any of tomorrow's secrets but what are some of the things that you're hearing from your audience from your customers from the people like Catherine and me whom uh, you've brought into your community that are beginning to uh, fire up those innovative uh, uh, juices for you mm. yeah really good point and and that story of Henry Ford I mean whether whether it's true and whether he said that I, I agree with you that I'm sure he he had his ear to the ground and knew exactly what he was doing and had he asked the question, well, what do you want? And they said, we want a faster horse. I suspect he might have followed that up with, why do you want a faster horse? And mm -hmm. you know, then the other person might answer, well, you know, when I, when I go to the shops to buy my shops, I want to get there quicker and I want to get back quicker. And, and you could ask a whole bunch more questions and that then opens up this whole idea of, you know, do you want to take, do you want film to make photographs or do you want to capture memories? And and the moment you get to that place, bit of, hey, I want to get from A to B faster and I want to get from A to B more comfortable and I want to perhaps carry more stuff from A to B in one trip rather than go five trips, uh, then that opens up a whole other uh range of possibilities than just a faster horse yeah and okay. and and the innovation comes because you've asked the question mm. and your customers have, have told you what they need yeah yeah that's I, right uh, coming coming back to your question i think one of the one of the things i'm getting a real strong sense of is is community is so important and there's this has been true for a while and been well recognized, uh, particularly in the online training space where you know, there's a common saying that people buy the training program for the content, but they stay for the community. The, a lot of people have kind of done that and they've built Facebook groups around their their particular product or training program and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical around this whole idea of Facebook groups because there's just so much noise on Facebook. And also I've heard stories where groups have been shut down by Facebook for all kinds of nebulous reasons that, that either the group owner or the participants in that community violated some nebulous terms of service and they didn't even realize that they were doing that it wasn't anything uh, sinister or like that but the group was just shut down and all of a sudden you've lost that community so I, one of the big trends i see is building a platform that you are on your own real estate whether it's a website or, or something else that you control to host that community and that gives you then the opportunity for people come in there with intent. So they go into that platform when they want to participate in conversations in that community or access resources in that community. So they're there because they want to be there, not because they've been kind of lured in while they're looking at their family photos on Facebook or something like that. And of course, they do what they want to do there without distraction from other other information like there would be on Facebook. The whole idea behind that technological shift, if you like, is what I'm hearing in people are really looking for this connection, looking for these conversations 
uh, there's, there's this concept of the knowledge marketplace and being able to talk to people online and, and just have these conversations that are quite meaningful rather than just a quick um, tweet and a like or something um, and a response. So to me, that is the big thing. And then ca really caring, really listening. So having those conversations gives you the opportunity to then ask questions and really listen to customers. So imagine a community where there's customers in the community where you have the opportunity to ask them, you know, why do you want the faster horse? And mm -hmm. what what does that look like? And what will I do for you? And really having a deep and meaningful conversation in a way that you can almost scale because when it's in that community and when it's like a an open feed, other people can contribute to that conversation. So you can learn so much more as a business in terms of what what opportunities are there that I can serve that community much better. I think that is one of the big trends I see that, that can apply across any kind of business across the board. Um, and it's, it's about you know the human connection. Uh, I talk about making marketing and podcasting human again. It's about really caring and being authentic. So it's not just uh, about, okay, let's have some likes and let's boost each other's posts like a lot of people um, kind of do on, on some of the social platforms. It's really caring about having great conversations, about serving that community and about learning and really growing myself for me as a person as well. Mm. That that that's one of the questions that I have in my mind for you is you know what have what you know what have you learned Tom has really sort of picked up on that what have you know I guess from a knowledge yeah. perspective what have you learned you know that's really um, fascinating and and you know you hadn't expected that's come out of this but the other one is what have you learned about yourself through this whole mm. journey yeah that's. That's a, a big one. Um, one of the things that for me has been a, a big lesson, I mean, we all have imposter syndrome, right? And uh, it sometimes it's a case of I've got this idea, oh, nobody will like that idea, That's nobody will like that. And what I've learnt is that we often undervalue ourselves and the contribution we have. And yes, the idea might fall on its face, but there's an opportunity to learn something by doing it. And somebody said recently, and I thought, this is brilliant. This, this was kind of one of my aha moments probably in the last three years. And I thought, why didn't I think of that? Because I'm trained as a scientist. They said, just run some exper run more experiments. If you have an idea, put it out there and treat it as an experiment. So the hypothesis, of course, is here's my idea. This is what I think will work. This is the outcome that I think will happen. So it's going to be successful. And if it's not successful, then here's the results. Document the results like a science experiment and then make a conclusion from that. So the conclusion is, OK, it didn't turn out as expected. Here's, what, here's the steps that didn't turn out as expected. Here's what we might be able to change in future to prevent that from happening or turn that into a positive step and then run the experiment again. So that was one thing for me that, you know, I'm, I'm trying very hard to change my mindset around that, saying, well, let's just run an experiment. And in doing that, you also take a step back from the ego thing so the experiment didn't work okay what did we learn from that is a different response to oh nobody liked my idea i guess i'm just no good so it it kind of takes the ego thing completely out of the equation and that's certainly something that um, was a big aha moment for me in the last few years i love 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 that answer Jurgen. and mm -hmm. and what I especially love about it is you've, you've nailed a really critical mindset idea about overcoming imposter syndrome, failing forward, 
um, learning from your mistakes, not being paralyzed by them. All of those are, are critical mindset mm. concepts. But I think what, what often happens is we, we adopt the mindset mantras I just peeled three of them off, right? <laughs> Fail forward and, you know, you're not an imposter, all those things. But we don't necessarily know how to truly act on what we might even, we, we might buy into the idea, but how do we act on it? Mm. And what you were describing was putting systems in place to support the mindset belief. And it's one of the things I really love about the work that you do. You are at, at heart a scientist. You come from a scientific mm -hmm. background and you love systems. And all of the work that you do in your business is system driven, including this example that you just shared. There's a mindset idea that I'm going to pursue and I'm going to put in a system of experimentation, analysis, so forth to to support this so that I can live this notion of failing forward. And you, you apply systems throughout your business. Can you talk a little bit about systems thinking mm. and where else you apply systems to uh, carry your business forward? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and it's funny because it reminds me of the time, I, I remember a time I was probably about eight or nine years old and I had this fetish with um, library cards. And <laughs> I would document, I would have this little box at home with library cards and I would document things and have them ordered. So this is what, how you do certain things. And I'd sort of step by step outline it. And some of it was, I guess, my, my scientific brain. Maybe there's something wired in there and um, from generations back in my genes. Some of it was, uh, and I say this even today, if I do something once and then I have to do it again in, say, a month's time, I often don't remember exactly what steps I've taken. And it takes me... So I had an example recently, and it's a very simple example of taking, taking a... PDF document of a newsletter and turning it into a web page for a client. Mm. And there's about 12 steps involved in this. And I did it once. And so even though I'm a systems thinker, I sometimes fall into this trap. I did it once, said, okay, tick, it's done. It took me two hours, parked it. A month later, it's a monthly newsletter. I was up for the same task again, did it again, took me two hours, and I thought, mm. gee, this is actually taking me a long time for a fairly simple task. And then the third time it came around, I thought, okay, I've <laughs> got to write down, what am I doing? <laughs> step one, step two, step three, and I documented it. it. Took me maybe two and a half hours because I documented it then. Months four, I opened up my process, it took me 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. because I knew exactly what I was doing. I didn't have to search for resources. I didn't have to um, go and look for things. I didn't have, or how did I do this? And didn't have to trial and error stuff. So that reminded me again, hey, always, always when I do something and there's a suspicion I might do it again, or even if not, just write down the steps I've taken and then put it somewhere that I can find it again. And what what I, I've done in all the work we do, particularly the big projects we do, I follow that advice, I document things, and then I go back and revisit them and, and we adapt the processes as we improve things, we'll um, adapt them. And that means a huge time saving the second and third time you do it. Absolutely. Yeah, and a, a quick follow up on that. Uh, a, a quick follow up on that and how how does that affect your mindset your your confidence your mm. uh overcoming procrastination um your uh the confidence that your clients have in you you know i'm thinking from the perspective of all these processes that you have in place around on board uh, around uh bringing podcast guests mm. to you, 
uh, evaluating them, agreeing that they should be on the show. So there were a lot of questions in there, but but confidence, mindset, uh, procrastination. How how does the systems thinking help you in that regard? Oh, it's it's invaluable. I mean, I can give you quite a few examples. So certainly, in terms of procrastination, if I've got a written process, then I know well I can do step one, and and even to the point of saying, well, I've only got ten minutes, and this might take me an hour. Well, I can do the first three steps and then pick it up from there. And that's a lot easier because I have everything documented and I can just tick off, okay, I've done the first three steps, 10 minutes, I can come back later when I've got some more time and finish off the, the remaining seven. So it certainly helps uh, avoid procrastination. The confidence thing is much different. So I'm in approaching something and somebody asked me, um, can you help me do X and I've got a process for X then obviously I've got yes I can help you do that that's here's here's the process we will follow and in terms of the the podcast I've had so many guests say to me that they've just had an exceptional experience from right at the beginning when first contact happened right through to the show recording and then after the show and it's all because we have this comprehensive process that we've built over time. It wasn't like this in the first 20 episodes, but we certainly learnt as we were going along, hey, it'd be good to have a booking system in place, for example. It'd be good to get reminders out to people at certain intervals to make sure that um, they, they don't forget because sometimes we book people three and four months out in advance so lots of things going on in everybody's world so it happens from time to time that somebody might forget so we built in those reminder systems so we've learned along the way all the little things that had gone wrong in the early days and we just built you know improved the system so that we covered those and People are always commenting, guests are always commenting what an exceptional experience it's been and also all the follow-up and all the information we provide them after we publish the show and help them promote and so on. It seems to me that, you know, there's some really valuable lessons in there for businesses, particularly small businesses in terms of uh, getting mm. some processes and systems in place, but also larger organisations. And there's two things that are bubbling for me uh, is the experimentation aspect of it. And I'm wondering how... How do you encourage people to to experiment when experimentation can seem like that potentially could be costly or time consuming or whatever it is? And mm. people go, I just want to know that it will work, you know, and if it doesn't, yeah. then, you know, maybe this is taking valuable time away or resources or whatever. And then how do you encourage people to put some systems into place, which we know when they're good systems they're incredibly useful we also know that there are some systems that are not so helpful mm. so helping people to distinguish between what's a good system or a helpful system what's unhelpful mm. yeah I, I might tackle a second question first the the systems one and this goes back to um, another guest on my show in fact this is I think he might be the only person that's had four appearances on the show David Jennings and he said to me once, and he he's, runs System Hub software and he's a founder of the systemology community, so he's a very systems person. He said to me once that the way you set up the system is if, if it's doable on, on a computer screen, um, it, then you can just do a screen recording and talk to the steps you're doing. Um, if not, and, and I've encouraged a plumber client of mine to do this, actually have somebody video him or his worker on the mobile phone and talking through, here's the steps you go through to connect this pipe, for example. And you then take that raw recording and you give it to the people that are going to be doing that task on a regular basis. And you empower them to say, well, here's, here's how I would do it. Uh, and I want you to kind of follow this process, but as you do that, you change it 
to best practice and and you update this documentation so you now write out from that video and from the work practice you do um, so that it actually represents exactly what you do now that does two things first of all it empowers the worker that that um, does that particular task all the time secondly it gets them thinking about the individual steps they do and often it improves the way they go about it and thirdly it then documents the process in a way that is up to date with what's happening right now. The next step after that then is, is to have a system in place, so a system for systems, that you regularly audit the processes. So you look mm -hmm. at ways that somebody can come in and say, well, is that still the best way to do this particular task? Or are there now better ways? Now, in terms of um, uh, tradespeople, Obviously, tools change. More modern tools get evolved over time. So all of a sudden, with, with new technology or a new tool, this particular task can be done in a better way, and that has to be incorporated. Mm. In terms of encouraging people to do experiments, I guess the way I approach it is to look at, can we connect it to a model that's there somewhere, whether it's in our work or whether it's something somebody else has done, that gives evidence that this particular experiment might actually work, this idea might succeed. And that, that's really the, the tricky part is finding something. So if there's some out there idea, finding something that's connected enough that gives us all confidence that, yes, this way out there idea might actually work and how can we now test it at a minimal cost and quickly get some feedback that will give us guidance as to whether it will work or whether it won't work and whether we can invest more, you know, whether it's worth investing more time or money into that to um, take it forward. That's probably the, the major thing that is, is kind of key to encouraging people to take that next step. And I, I look at that myself as well sometimes I have these wild ideas and I think well there's nothing nothing remotely like that around so what's going to give me the confidence other than personally I like that idea which is an ego thing again uh, but what is there that if I let go of that ego that gives me the confidence that this might actually work mm. oh that's fascinating hmm. so we're here celebrating your 500th episode of this podcast five we're now at 501 and uh i think back to when you were starting and i imagine you can elaborate on this that there was a certain sense of experimentation at the beginning mm. that you were diving into something not not certain but i think with 500 of these under your belt, you've probably proven to yourself that this works. Mm. And I know we've talked about uh, podcasting and the power of podcasting. Um, walk us through that journey and in so doing, help the audience understand um, the discoveries you made as you were experimenting through 500 episodes. And when you finally discovered that, you know what, this is a really powerful mm. medium uh, and share some of those reasons that podcasting is so powerful and special. Mm. Yeah, great question, Tom. Uh, yeah, when I first started, it was a mentor who suggested that I should do a podcast because it was a great positioning and marketing tool for my business and for me. And he showed me what was required. So I'd been listening to audio books and podcasts for a long time and was a big fan of podcasts. I always had this vision that people were set up in a professional radio studio. That's how they did the podcast. So I never really took that leap of it's something that I could do. Uh, but this mentor showed me what a, a really minimal setup could be at home and I thought, well, I can do that. That's easy. And so I got started. And the other thing was that I had had a 23-year corporate career in a in, in company where I had a lot of international roles. And I traveled a lot internationally and dealt with lots of clients 
senior managers, CEOs and business owners of fairly large corporations all around the world, as well as um, colleagues who, um, many of whom had then moved on into other companies and were doing really amazing things. I was still connected to a lot of them at a personal level, but I didn't really have a professional connection any longer. When I started the podcast, I thought that's my opportunity to reach out and connect, reconnect with these people at the professional level because I had a list of probably 20 straight off the bat who were doing really innovative things and with the theme of innovation that I picked, I thought they'd be fantastic guests. So that kind of got me started. Very quickly, I was also introduced to other people who could come on the show and I also started asking some people that I met at events to come on the show. One of the things I did very early on was very carefully script out each episode. As a result, some of those early episodes sounded very stilted because I'd have, right, okay, question one, and then the person would answer. And rather than then allowing a natural conversation to flow, I'd have, okay, let's move on to question two. And I realized that I was doing the kind of podcast that I hated listening to, you know, where there's like, <laughs> it's question one, question two. And as I started listening back, and it took me a little while to overcome my revulsion at listening to my own voice to listen back to the show, um, and I convinced myself I have to listen back because that's the only way I'm going to learn how to improve. As I listened back to the early episodes, I realized that there were some fabulous early episodes and they were with the people that I knew really well, the people that I'd connected to that I mentioned earlier. And I realised that I've got to get it to a point where I can have this free-flowing conversation with friends. And so over time, it really evolved to that and I actually took the steps I remember going through removing the word interview for, from any of our materials. So all the briefing materials, the calendar appointments, everything. There's nothing that refers to interview. And it either says conversation or discussion or words like that. And the process then, you know, we incorporated this step that we talked about before we started recording of, of having this get-to-know-you call. And the purpose of the get-to-know-you call started out in a way to really be a filter for um, making sure that the potential guest was in fact a really good fit for our audience and for our subject. It then added an element that, that I wasn't really expecting but made sense in that I got to know the person, even though we only chatted for 15 minutes, both of us got to know one another. Then when we came on the show recording, it was like, oh, hello, we've already had a conversation. You're like an old friend. Mm -hmm. And so it became that um, conversation between old friends. And and it's given me the confidence also in, in times, uh, which is something that I've learned over those many episodes to say, I can carry a conversation here. If I've got three or four bullet points to start me off, I can carry a meaningful conversation with this guest. Mm. Mm. That, that's fabulous. And to me, you know, what comes out of that is that the, there's these fabulous skills that you've woven together to, to come to this point, which is, you know, this uh, deep interest in technology and innovation, the systems approach and then the people, you know, that real human connection. And you've really woven them together beautifully to create, you know, this, what is becoming a real legacy, isn't it, in many respects mm. of, of podcasting? I hope does so. That, how does it feel for you? Um, do, you, do, you have, do you have the same sense of that, Jürgen? In some ways, yeah. It's, I've never really thought about that in terms of a legacy, although where I mean, one of the things we do with each episode is a lot of repurposing of content, saying, well, there's, there's a 45-minute a to an hour conversation here, but there's so much content that we can extract from that. And then I think back, well, we've got over 500 episodes. 
like that and we've got a section called the buzz which we ask of every guest so there's 500 or nearly 500 versions of that that would make for really good content as well so yes there there is certainly a legacy there and mm. Mm. Absolutely. And by the way, audience, that was that was Jurgen Systems thinking at work, <laughs> repurposing Indeed. content, taking the buzz. It was uh, there was uh, uh, there was a lot of gold in 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 just the last thirty seconds of what Jurgen said. So, oh, absolutely. Jurgen, when when you and I talked about the, yep, yeah, when when you and I talked about the power of podcasting, Jurgen, you shared with me some some data about why podcasting versus other content channels can still be mm. so powerful. I think, I think some people think, um, you know, it, it, I've missed the bus Yeah, too late if I want to start podcasting, but I think you would argue otherwise. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, one of the statistics that I think you're referring to, um, that kind of startled me as well. And, it relates to the number of blogs that are on the internet and the number that I saw, and this is going back a few months now, so it might be a lot bigger than this, was of the order of 6 billion, if I remember correctly. And yet people are, are still blogging. It's, it's almost to the point now where if you have a website, then people accept that blogging is part of it. They may, not, they may only blog... They may only post on that blog once a month or maybe once every three months. Some people do it once a week. Some do it once a day. But there seems to be a general acceptance that blogging is part of getting information out there to your online audience. And there's six billion of those. There's only two million active podcasts on the internet. So when you consider that and people saying, well, it's too late to start a podcast, yes, there's 2 million out there, active ones. So active ones are ones that are regularly producing content. Yet 6 billion blogs, so writing a blog post, you're competing against 6 billion blogs. Producing a podcast, the competition is much less. And I think if people have a message they can build an audience, they can build a community, they have value to add to that community. I think uh, podcasting is, is a really good way to do that. It's easy and low cost to get into. You really just need a good microphone. That um, external microphone works much better than the internal ones on computer and they're only, you can get an external microphone for less than $100 and a set of headsets and you can just use what comes with your mobile phone usually that's good enough uh, because the audience won't hear the headset that's just to prevent echoes you don't need this fancy yellow sennheiser one that i've got mm -hmm. and then the medium is so convenient for the listeners you can listen to a podcast while you're commuting in fact I, when I'm driving my car on my own I've always got some podcast running on the radio um, when I'm walking I'm often listening to podcasts when I'm gardening I can listen to podcasts so um, you know they say men can't multitask but I can listen to <laughs> podcasts and drive or walk or garden <laughs> and it, it's uh, very time effective and then of course it's very intimate in some ways because that person's voice is in my ear. They're in my head. So it's a really good way to connect with your audience. Indeed it is, absolutely. And you've done a lot of connecting with a lot of people. And I wonder, Jürgen, um, what is something that... Um, and, and in terms of the podcasting, I, I think it's... It, 
probably does feel overwhelming for people sometimes. So you do, mm. again, because you've been able to systematize things, you're there to also help people to be able to do this mm. as well. You know, there, you've created something that, you know, is the podcast and created community, but also a way of helping and enabling people to do that. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that at all? Yes, yeah. Well, we've we've actually just published <clears throat> our entire podcasting process as an audio program and it's it's basically freely available on our website so go to innovabiz.com.au you're probably here listening to this and it's there on the home page you can sign up for that and we're right now in the process of building out a community platform that I talked about earlier our very own community platform we're calling it flywheel nation because after the flywheel which is the podcast and the podcasting program will actually sit on there so if you join and register for that program you get to have the whole audio program there's 14 um, audio lessons in there plus all the documentation that goes with it to run through all of the steps that we do in our podcast so that that will help people actually get started and of course we have a whole bunch of ways we can support people further from that if they want us to help help them produce the show or do some of the editing or if they want a completely done for you service we we offer all of that and we offer some coaching if they if they're doing it themselves but they just want somebody to give them advice and help them overcome any hurdles that they might encounter along the way. So we've got all of that. Wow, what a fabulous um, opportunity to be able to have access to that yoga. And that's incredibly generous. Great. Yeah. So, Jürgen, one one question I had, I think you and I are both comfortable behind the microphone, but if forced to answer the are you an introvert or extrovert <laughs> question, we would probably describe ourselves as introverts. Um, how does an introvert do 500 episodes of a podcast, 500 and counting? Yeah. This is something I often ask myself as well. And I think it's probably important to, for those people that think introverts hide away in the corner and don't speak to anyone and extroverts are out there as the life of the party. That's not necessarily the definition. I know of introverts who can be the life of the party and I know of extroverts that are actually quite quiet, not necessarily shy, but certainly quiet. The difference is that extroverts need that external exposure, the external interactions with other people to feed their energy, whereas introverts generate their own energy inside. And in fact, extreme introverts, and I probably would class myself as a little bit of an extreme introvert, find interacting with people and trying to be the life of the party very energetically draining. It costs a lot of energy. So I find that, um, well, one of the things I used to attend a lot of exhibitions, big exhibitions when I was in my corporate job. And in those exhibitions, you're in amongst lots of different people. You're having conversations all the time. At the end of those days, I would be absolutely exhausted. In fact, usually I would need a week to recover from a couple of days of those exhibitions. That That's kind of the introvert nature. To answer your question, how, do, how does a, an introvert get in front of the microphone and do 500 episodes? Part of it is just the process and just going through the process. The, and I find it difficult to have meaningful conversations with people at these traditional networking events where you meet somebody and there's the expectation of the conversation will usually flow along, well, hi Tom, what do you do? And here's my business card. I find those really difficult and, and part of that is the, the 
boundaries we put on ourselves in terms of the expectations of what the outcome. So in the podcast, for example, or in some of the events that I run myself, I get to create the environment where it's not that. It's uh, let's have a meaningful conversation. And to me, then, it's, again, coming back to this idea of conversation between friends. Even though we may not know one another terribly well, we, we can very quickly get to this level of a conversation between friends. And so that, to me, is my comfort zone in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I think that really what you're talking about is just because you're introverted, that doesn't mean that you devalue the mm. importance of human connection. You, no, in fact, all. you you highly value the uh, the human connection. In fact, you probably um, um, you you have less tolerance for the small talk mm. because it doesn't feed any you That's know right. yeah, sort there's... of social energy. Mm. Um, but you and in in many ways that's what makes you so great at uh, creating the human connection. And, and um, so it, it's a fascinating co- uh, question to me because I can relate uh, mm. to you. And, and, and I think it's a really important conversation because I think a lot of people out there are hesitant to take the step and put themselves out there because they think of themselves as introverted and I think you're living proof that, no, you can do this. You can make that human connection. In fact, in many ways, it, you may be better suited to do it than, than others because, of, um, because you're an introvert. It's, uh, mm. yeah, I'm like, not sure, but, uh, but I, like I, I really do appreciate yeah, like the way you look at it. <laughs> yeah. And, and maybe there's a reflective nature there too. So in that reflective sort of aspect of the of that sort of quieter, sort of more introverted way of being, that actually, you know, it does enable you to, to you know, be more present potentially as, you know, that you're, you're in that more reflective state, you know, to be able to receive uh, people in a different way potentially mm. as well which is quite interesting. So before we put you back into the, um, uh, you know, the driver's seat, Jürgen, <laughs> and, and take the <laughs> the focus off you and, and uh, allow you to regain control of the steering wheel, is there, are there any questions? Is there something burning that we haven't asked you that you would <laughs> want us to ask you? What would that, what would that be? Oh. We did discuss this, but I actually wasn't prepared for that. Um, if I had, if I was put on the spot now, and I am put on the spot, I would say, um, yeah, what, what's the, yeah, what do I see as the future of podcasting? Maybe, mm-hmm. although we have we have talked about that a lot but yeah there's what what's happening in the podcasting world and I mean I probably should fire the question back at you and say what are you seeing in the podcasting world I mean some of the things that I see uh, you know based on this idea of community but the and and one of the things that we're exploring is how do we give the audience the ability to continue the conversations after the show. And there's platforms out there now like Clubhouse, although I was reading something the other day that it's kind of peaked and (laughs) waning again. But there is technology around where people can have these random conversations with anyone. And I think podcasting is getting to that point where... uh, the ability to have audience interaction is going to become more and more important. A lot of podcasters now are starting to do live streams and and we're looking at exploring that in the future as well. So on live streams, of course, you can have the audience that's there at the time when it's live asking questions of the people on the podcast. I think that's one of the big ones. It's just becoming much more interactive 
medium and playing back into this idea of meaningful conversations so that the conversations are not just between those that are on the podcast in front of the microphones, it's also going to include the audience. Mm, fascinating. Very, very interesting. Well, I'm going to how, hand how you, the... You see um, that from your point of view. <laughs> Tom, do you have a sense of that for yourself at all? Is that something that's emerging in your world? Yeah, I I completely agree with what what Jurgen was saying that the interaction is is a critical thing and trying to as a podcast host, I am interested in serving my guests so that they can make those those connections with audience members who truly value what they heard, what they saw, and make the connections, continue the conversation. And as a podcast guest, I, I value those opportunities. And I know uh, Jurgen has very interesting conversations happening along those fronts. I'm about to begin experimenting with, uh, with doing live, um, live presentations. I think the challenge for me, the question that I... Uh, be interested in hearing you answer, Jurgen. Is uh, does it change the length of the podcast? Because mm -hmm. your episodes tend to run close to an hour, um, as do mine. Mine are in that forty-five minute range or so, and I am struggling with the question of is that an appropriate length for. Mm -hmm a live event or should I keep it under 30 minutes? I'm wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm still not sure about that either. I've been on some podcasts as a guest that were run live and if I think back, they were close to the hour mark. Uh, there weren't a lot of people interacting live. In fact, there are only perhaps six or seven on each of those, so there's just two that I've been on that I can recall that were live. I'm guessing that most of their audience would be listening to the recordings afterwards. Right. So it's one of those things that I'm not really sure about, but like you, uh, going live, you have to be much more mindful of the time as you go forward. And of course, if audience questions come in at a very high rate, that will add to the conversations that and the length of the conversations. So it's it's something that adds a different level of management challenge, I guess. Mm, mm, absolutely. Well, I've really enjoyed the panel conversations that you've had. I think they've been incredibly. And, and what's interesting for me is that it really does invite me to want to go back to you know those podcasts and listen again and to reach out and make connection with people it's quite it's been quite a different sense and feeling than um yeah just listening to somebody who you don't know mm. but once you actually have the opportunity to meet like you know tom and i have now met a couple of times and so you really it is that building of relationships and, and you start to build that sort of intimacy and sense of community and I, I really value that very very much in in that regard so um, more power to you Jürgen in that regard mm. in terms of how you've already started to you know expand out from you know probably sort of traditional podcasting into <laughs> experimenting with yeah. you know other ideas and, and possibilities so it's great. All right. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And, and certainly, the I mean, I really enjoyed the panel discussions as well. And I think that's something that we'll do a bit more of in the future. Maybe pick a specific topic and bring on a couple of experts in that area and, um, yeah, explore that in depth. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to hand I back over to you idea. now, Jürgen. <laughs> to be the <laughs> take us take us out or whatever it is that we're going to do in that regard all right well thanks yeah thanks so much tom and catherine i really appreciate you doing this for me and putting me under the hammer and under the grill um it's been a fascinating conversation lots of interesting things to reflect on and some things that i don't necessarily talk about on podcasts before so um 
would be interesting for me to listen back to this as well. So thanks for doing this for me. Thanks for being in my world and being on the show. And I certainly encourage all of the listeners to go and check out that panel discussion where both Catherine and Tom were on. That was 500, episode 500, part three. It was the last episode, in fact. And also check out Tom and Catherine's episodes on um, on the Innova Buzz podcast. We'll have links to those in the show notes. So thanks again. All the best for the future. And I know we'll keep in touch. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jürgen. See you, Tom. Thank you. Good to see you too. Thank you, Catherine. You Bye. too.